Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dr. Hart Beatty. I'd like to welcome all of you to the APDR National Virtual Noon Conference Series. Hope you all are well. We are, again, very excited to have two amazing speakers today. Um, uh, I'd like to go through a couple of housekeeping items like we do uh, every week. Um, as you all know, the lectures are being recorded and are being hosted on the APDR YouTube channel. Um, not only are the lectures being recorded, but the comments and questions are also being recorded. Uh, as you know, as you attend, your microphones are muted to ensure optimal quality for the participants. And if you do have questions for our presenters, we ask that you use the Q&A tool in the Zoom platform. And if we can't answer them uh, during the live session, then we will uh, get to them uh, afterwards and um, we'll email the questions to our presenters and hopefully they'll have some time in their busy schedules to uh, get back uh, to you on those. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our two um, educators for today. Uh, first, we have Dr. John Mongin, uh, Vice Chair for Informatics and Associate Professor of Clinical Radiology at UCSF. Uh, John's a great guy, uh, and um, he's going to be speaking on ultrasound evaluation of kidney and liver transplants. Uh, and secondly, we're really honored to have Desiree Morgan, Vice Chair of Education and Professor of Radiology at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, who's going to be speaking about pancreatitis. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to uh, invite Dr. Mongan to share his screen and uh, begin his presentation. And again, thank you so much for joining us. Hello everyone. So again, I'm John Mongan from uh, UC San Francisco, and I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to speak to you all today about sonographic evaluation of transplants. These are my disclosures, and none of these are relevant to the talk I'm giving today. So today we're going to be talking about organ transplants and specifically the two most common abdominal organ transplants, kidney transplants and liver transplants. So what I'd really like you to remember about this talk that, you know, if you remember nothing else, that the take home message here is that the two keys to be able to effectively evaluate these organ transplants are understanding what the post transplant anatomy looks like. So you know what you're looking for in these occasionally kind of fuzzy ultrasound images and knowing which complications you should expect in these. So you know what kind of pathology to look for. And if you understand those two things, which we're going to go through over the course of this talk, it will really enable you to make all the important diagnosis of transplant complications. So we're going to begin with kidney transplants. So we can have different kinds of transplants, different anatomy of the transplants, depending on where the kidney donor comes from. And so the donated kidney can either come from an adult or a pediatric donor. If it comes from an adult donor, it can be either from a living donor or a cadaveric donor. Pediatric donor kidneys are almost always on block donations where both kidneys are taken together along with a segment of the IVC and the aorta. And so that can obviously only come from a cadaveric donor. When these kidney transplants are hooked up into the patient, uh, into the recipient, we have to connect the arterial supply, the venous drainage, and then the ureteral drainage. The vascular connections can either be done as an end-to-side anastomosis, as you see here on the image left, or as an end-to-end -end anastomosis. End-to-side anastomoses are more common. End-to-end -end anastomoses are done when there's, uh, when there's reasons that the end-to-side can't be performed, typically due to complications in the recipient vascular anatomy. One of the things to be aware of is there's often a difference between a cadaveric donor and a living donor here. In a cadaveric donor, typically they'll take a portion of the aorta along with the renal artery. This is called a carol patch. And that gives, more, uh, that, that gives a larger area for the anastomosis to be done. And so typically there are fewer complications with the arterial anastomosis in a cadaveric donor kidney than in a living donor kidney because clearly they can't take a patch of the aorta from a living donor. For a pediatric on block donor, there's two ways that that can be hooked up into an adult recipient. One is to do an interposition of the donor's aorta and IVC into the external iliac artery and external iliac vein of the recipient. 
The other way is to suture close one end of the aorta and IVC from the donor and then do an end to side anastomosis of the donor aorta and donor IVC to the recipient artery and vein. All right, so now we've seen what the anatomy of these renal transplants looks like. Now let's have a look at what the, what the normal appearance of a healthy renal transplant should be. So the first thing that you wanna make sure is that the entire graft, the entire kidney is well perfused. And it's important that you really make sure that you're seeing image, an image or a series of images that show you perfusion throughout the entire kidney, because sometimes there can be a small artery that supplies one pole or supplies part of it, and you may have perfusion in part of the graft, but part of it that's infarcted. Then we wanna interrogate the arcuate arteries in the parenchymal arteries in the kidney. And what we're looking for here is the shape of the waveform. So in a normal, healthy kidney, we wanna see these nice, sharp, abrupt, almost vertical systolic upstrokes. And we wanna see positive diastolic flow throughout uh, the, the cardiac cycle. And then quantitatively, we measure this resistive index, which is one minus the, the end diastolic velocity over the peak systolic velocity. And we use that as sort of a diagnostic measure and normal values are in the 70s. Um, in the 80s starts to get a little bit elevated. Anything above the 80s is considered, is considered definitely elevated. We also wanna make sure that we've got good supply in the, uh, at the arterial anastomosis and we're oftentimes interested in the peak systolic velocity there. Um, that should be typically no more than about two meters per second. We'll talk more about that in a couple minutes and that we have good flow in the main renal vein and at the anastomosis there. All right, so although the, uh, the normal anatomy of a healthy kidney is certainly beautiful to look at, in my opinion, really the reason that we're doing this imaging is to identify complications. And I think that it's easiest to think of this if we organize these complications into different categories. And so the categories that I think of for complications are first vascular, so in the vascular category, we can have either the arteries or the veins get thrombosis in them. We can have them be too narrow. They can be stenotic. Um, they can develop pseudoaneurysms or AV fistulas, uh, or they can leak, and then you can get hematomas. The kidney can undergo rejection because it's coming from, you know, one, from a donor into a different immune environment in the recipient, and it can develop ATN or tu acute tubular necrosis, just like a native kidney can. We frequently see fluid collections around these transplanted kidneys, and there can be a number of different etiologies of these fluid collections. Hematomas are common, and these can be either perinephric next to the kidney or subcapsular within the kidney. Um, abscesses can develop. If we have uh, urine leaks, we can get urinomas, and lymphocytes are also fairly common in the uh, locations where these are implanted. And again, we also have to make a ureteral connection. And so that can either be too tight, in which case we get obstruction and see hydronephrosis, or it can be not fully competent, in which case we get leak. And again, that causes a urinoma. And patients who receive these transplants have to be immunosuppressed. And as a consequence of that immunosuppression, they can develop post-transplant lymphoproliferative disease, or PTLD. And it's important to keep in mind that that PTLD most commonly affects other areas in the body. It doesn't necessarily just affect, you, you, you don't, it's not necessarily localized to the transplanted organ. All right, so let's start by talking about vascular complications because these are some of the most important and most common for transplanted kidneys. So one of the ways that we use to sort of uh, differentiate between potential uh, vascular complications and, and an important aspect of the vasculature that we look at is the resistive index. And so if those resistive indices are high, particularly if they're above the 80s, then there's a differential of three things that you need to know for these elevated resistive indices. And those are venous thrombosis, acute tubular necrosis, and rejection. When you see this high RI, the thing that you really want to have in mind, the thing that's the middle of the night on-call emergency is main renal vein thrombosis. And this is because main renal vein thrombosis can lead to loss of the kidney within a few hours, 
And this is something that the transplant surgeons will take that patient immediately back to the OR for. So when you see a high RI, particularly if it's very high, if it's 100%, you wanna pay special attention to the renal veins and make sure that you're 100% confident that the renal veins are patent. Now, most of the time they will be. Main renal vein thrombosis is not all that common. Um, so most of the time it's gonna be one of these other two things on the differential, either ATN or rejection. Uh, ATN is more common in the first couple of weeks, immediately post-transplant. Rejection is more common later. So that's how you would order your differential based on how long it's been since the transplant. But unfortunately, there is overlap in the appearance between these and we can't distinguish these just by imaging alone. And so biopsy is really the, the tool for determining whether it's ATN or rejection. When we have venous thrombosis, as I said, there, we typically have very high resistance waveforms. So there, you'll see no end diastolic uh, velocity, zero end diastolic velocity, a resistive index of 100%. We oftentimes also see diastolic reversal. And so again, when you see a waveform like this, you wanna go look carefully at the main renal vein in the hilum. And if you see something like this, so here we see only a single vessel that's filling in with color. We see it flashing red and blue. So that's the main renal artery and we're seeing that forward flow in systole and then reverse flow in diastole. And you can see that next to it, right here, we just have kind of a hypoechoic region that's the thrombosed main renal vein. So this is an emergency you need to get in touch with the uh, transplant surgeons right away because they need to take this patient back to the operating room. So if we're gonna use resistive indices as an important diagnostic criteria, it's important to make sure that we are measuring them accurately and understanding them correctly. And there's really two ways that you can go wrong with this. The first way is that you can underestimate the resistive index by thinking that there's diastolic flow when all you actually have there is noise. So if you look at the image on this slide, if you just kind of glance at it, this looks pretty normal. We've got a resistive index of 75%. There we see the waveform. Let's move on to the next image. But let's look a little bit more closely at that waveform and try to decide whether we really think that's actually diastolic flow or whether it's noise. And I use four criteria for trying to decide whether or not something is really diastolic flow or whether it's noise. And it's probably noise if you have equal height above and below the baseline, if it's flat all the way through diastole, not, client, not declining, not fluctuating, because real flow changes throughout diastole, whereas noise remains constant. If you've got an angle or a corner at the end of the systolic peak, where the systolic peak sort of plunges into this floor of noise, and then another thing, a final thing that you don't always see, but when you do is a real tip off, is diastolic flow does not continue through systole. So if you're looking at a part of the waveform that you're thinking might be diastolic flow, but you can trace that continuously through the systolic peak, that's not diastolic flow, that's noise. The other way that you can go wrong with this is missing diastolic flow when it's really there. And this is typically related to incorrect settings in the wall filter. So when you look at an ultrasound image, there's generally this block of numbers and letters up in the corner that you completely ignore. One of those things usually says something like WF. WF stands for wall filter. And a wall filter is something that suppresses very low velocity Doppler signal. It's intended to suppress the motion of the whole wall of the vessel as a pulse comes through it. And that's important for being able to see the part of the signal that we're interested in. But when that wall filter is set too high, it obscures not only the motion of the vessel wall, but also slow flow within the vessel. And so when, you, when, when that happens, it looks like your resistive index is 100%. And you can be tipped off to this by seeing this black band around the baseline. So all you see are the systolic peaks, and then you're not seeing any noise, you're not seeing any diastolic flow, you're just seeing a black band around the baseline. So if that's what you're seeing and you're thinking that the resistive index is 100% or this is being presented to you as a resistive index of 100%, you need to ask the sonographer to go back and decrease the wall filter so that you can see something there. And in some cases like this, that'll actually reveal the slow diastolic flow that's there. And we can see that in this patient, the resistive index was actually quite normal in the 70s, not 100%. In other patients, when you decrease the wall filter, you'll see that all there is there is noise. And then we've talked about how you identify that as noise. And then you know that the, you know confidently that the resistive index actually is 
One other thing to be aware about the resistive indices is that these are dependent on heart rate because it's a ratio of the peak systolic velocity to the end diastolic velocity. And so when a patient has a very fast heart rate, there's not very much time for that diastolic velocity to decline. We have a relatively higher end diastolic velocity, and so we end up with a lower resistive index, an artifactually lower resistive index. And when they're bradycardic, there's a lot of time for that end diastolic velocity to decline. It tends to be artifactually lower, and we get artifactually elevated resistive indices. There's no quantitative correction factor for this. This is just something to be aware of and sort of caveat that if you're seeing sort of moderately increased resistive indices and someone who's very bradycardic, it's probably just an artifact of their heart rate and doesn't necessarily say anything about the health of the kidney. Another important vascular complication is stenosis, particularly stenosis of the renal artery, and we most often see this at the main renal artery anastomosis. And the thing to tip you off to this is looking at the shape of the waveforms of these arcuate arteries within the kidney. And when we start losing those nice vertical upstrokes, those nice vertical systolic upstrokes, and start getting more like these slow, rounded systolic upstrokes, then that's a parvus tardis waveform, and that's due to stenosis or narrowing of the artery supplying the kidney. Another consequence that we frequently see coming along with this is because the kidney is not getting as much blood as it wants, it dilates its, arterial, its arterioles and its arterial bed, and we get increased diastolic flow to sort of compensate for the decreased overall flow that we're getting. And so that decrease in the height of the systolic peak and increase in the uh, diastolic flow gives us decreased RIs, so low RIs and these rounded systolic waveforms. When we see that, you want to go interrogate the main renal artery and look, try to find the peak velocity uh, in the main renal artery, and that will indicate both the location of the stenosis and give you some measure of the severity of the stenosis. So we can see here that we had a peak velocity of almost five meters per second, which is markedly elevated. One thing to be aware of this is you, we frequently see sort of mild stenosis or mild narrowing with mild parvus tardis in the first couple of weeks post-op, and that can be related to edema due to the suturing at the site of the anastomosis. And when that's mild, that oftentimes resolves within the first couple of weeks post-transplant. Again, the reason that we use ultrasound to evaluate these transplants is that a lot of the things that we're looking at are vascular complications, and a lot of the analysis that we do is Doppler evaluation. And so just as we talked about with the resistive indices, it's really important to make sure that your sonographers are using correct Doppler technique so that you can trust the images that they're showing you. And so one of the things with measuring this peak velocity, this peak systolic velocity at the main renal artery anastomosis that you need to recognize is that the stenosis is very, very focal, and that peak velocity occurs over a tiny, tiny region in space. And so you're only going to measure the true peak velocity if you have the gate positioned exactly over that, that correct region in space. And so if you have an image that's presented to you like this, where the color Doppler scale is set fairly low so that you're seeing the whole sweep of the artery, then the problem is you have no proof that that gate has been set at the right place. They may have set it at the right place, but we've just got aliasing all along this vessel. We don't really know whether there might be somewhere else where the velocity is actually higher. So what I ask my sonographers to do is to increase the color scale to something very high. So you see that most of the color in that artery drops out. All that's left is a little knot of color there where the velocity is the highest. And now when they put the gate on that remaining knot of color, now I have proof recorded for all of posterity that that gate was placed in the right place and that we're truly measuring the peak systolic velocity. Another important complication is arteriovenous fistula. This is best identified on color Doppler. I typically set the scale very high, so that makes almost all the rest of the color Doppler signal in the kidney drop out. and makes it really easy to identify this rather than looking for a needle in a haystack. And we can oftentimes see a dilated feeding artery and draining vein. You want to confirm this with pulse wave and look for a high velocity, low resistance waveform. Perinephric hematomas are extremely common postoperatively. I'd say almost all kidneys have at least some perinephric uh, hematoma in the immediate post-op period. 
um, it's really the subcapsular hematomas that you want to be looking for that are, are that are of greater concern. And this is because for the same size hematoma, a subcapsular hematoma, since it's contained within that capsule, exerts much more mass effect and much more pressure on the renal parenchyma. And if you have a subcapsular hematoma, as illustrated in this cine clip, you want to make sure that you're evaluating the risk resistive indices in the tissue that's compressed immediately adjacent to the subcapsular hematoma, because oftentimes you'll have normal RIs in the other part of the kidney, but the part of the kidney that's immediately adjacent to the subcapsular hematoma will have an RI of 100%. And that's important as a measure of the impact that that hematoma is having on the kidney and whether or not it needs to be evacuated. Another potential etiology for fluid collections is urine leak or urinoma. And if you have large collections that accumulate rapidly without a drop in hematocrit, you should be particularly suspicious for a urinoma. One of the things that's important to be aware of is there's oftentimes an assumption that if you see complexity within a fluid collection, it must be a hematoma because urine doesn't clot. Um, that's kind of a false pearl. This image that I'm showing you here, the cine clip, is a urinoma. The urine can oftentimes dissect through fascial planes or there's adhesions around it. So you can oftentimes see the, what, you know, the appearance of stranding and what looks like septations even within a urinoma. So don't discount the possibility of urinoma just because you see some complexity. And this is confirmed with ultrasound guided aspiration of the fluid and laboratory analysis of that fluid. We talked about the significant overlap in the appearance between ATN and rejection with them both resulting in high resistive indices. And so the evaluation of that is really through uh, biopsy of the transplant. We do a whole lot of these in my department, typically about four or five a day. Uh, and the approach here is to guide the core needle such that it's going to have a pass that goes as entirely through cortex. You, when you're doing this, you want to make sure that you know what the throw length of your core device is so that before you fire it, you know how far it's going to extend through the kidney. So you want to try to avoid creating an exit wound. You don't want to go through and through. Those exit wounds tend to bleed a lot more than the entry wounds do. And the common complications of these transplants, of these transplant biopsies are hemorrhage and AV fistula. All right, so now we'll move on to liver transplants. Again, these can come from cadaveric or living donors. When they come from a cadaveric donor, the recipient may get the whole liver. When they come from a living donor, we have to leave some for the donor, and so it's always a partial transplant. For partial transplants, you recognize these as the quinoa segments of the liver. And the significance of this is that the small vessels and bile ducts don't cross the boundaries of these segments. So we can divide the liver along any of these segmental boundaries. Essentially, any combination of segments and any combination of divisions along these boundaries that you can imagine has at one time or another been tried for dividing a liver for transplant. But the two most common are dividing it into the right and left hepatic lobes along the solid red line. And one of the other things to be aware of is if you have an adult donor to a pediatric recipient, typically you can't fit an entire adult lobe into the pediatric recipient. And so they'll take just the left lateral segment, just segments two and three as indicated by the red dotted line from the adult and put that into the, into the pediatric recipient. When you have a whole liver transplantation, um, classically the way this was done is with an interposition where the recipient, part of the recipient's IVC was removed along with the recipient's uh, liver. And then the donor IVC is interposed into the <clears throat> recipient's anatomy. And we have anastomoses at the hepatic artery, the portal vein, and the common bile duct. What's done, I think, more commonly now for uh, recipients of whole livers is what's called a piggyback anastomosis, where the recipient's IVC remains intact and the donor's IVC is anastomosed to a stump of the hepatic vein of the recipient. And really the main thing, I think that's important to be aware of this is that what this means is that at some cross-sectional levels in the patient's body, you're gonna see two IVCs. And if you're not expecting that, that can be really confusing. For a partial liver transplant, the, uh, we, it's a similar appearance. We have the hepatic vein anastomose to a recipient hepatic vein stump. And typically the important difference here is that there's not enough bile duct to actually make a direct anastomosis to the recipient 
common duct. And so we end up with a colodoca jejunostomy, bringing up a loop of bowel into the, to the, to the liver for the biliary drainage of the liver. Normal appearance of a liver transplant uh, is pretty similar actually to normal appearance of a native liver. In the hepatic arteries, we want rapid systolic upstrokes. In the portal veins, monophasic with mild variations with respiration. In the hepatic veins and IVC, phasic flow reflecting the cardiac cycle. So that's it, and the bile ducts should be non-dilated. So that's it in words. This is the same thing in picture. Uh, nice sort of monophasic portal venous waveform, sharp systolic upstrokes in the hepatic arteries, and phasic flow in the hepatic veins. In liver transplants, we have essentially the same categories of complications that we do for the kidney transplants. Vascular, we have fluid collections. Instead of urinary complications or ureal complications, we have biliary complications, uh, but they can have the same things, either stricture or leak, rejection, and then P PTLD. We also, because many of these comp transplants are done for patients with hepatocellular carcinoma, we have an additional thing that we want to look for, which is recurrent hepatocellular carcinoma. We're particularly interested about the hepatic arteries in liver transplants. And so we want to look carefully for these parvus tardis waveforms in the branch hepatic arteries. And the reason for that is that although there's a dual blood supply to the liver, the biliary system is entirely dependent on hepatic arterial perfusion. So if you lose hepatic arterial flow to a liver transplant, you're at risk for biliary necrosis. We can get thromboses, and these typically occur in the veins where the flow is slower, most commonly in the portal vein, but can also sometimes be seen in hepatic veins. And then post-op hematomas and fluid collections are very common, again, around these liver transplants. If you have a large or less complex collection, um, that may be a bioloma rather than a hematoma. And for partial liver transplants, we very frequently see a small collection at the cut edge of the, of the liver. And that can oftentimes persist for a fairly long time, for months even after uh, the transplant. So I think that sometimes, you know, these can feel pretty abstract sitting in a reading room and, you know, looking at all these numbers and images come in and reports go out. But as just in closing here, I wanted to show that this is something, you know, an area of radiology where I feel like we really can make an immediate difference for our patients. So this was a study that I got on call of a liver transplant. And you can see here in the right hepatic artery, we have these parvus tardis waveforms, really slow upstrokes and elevated diastolic flow. When we go and look at the proper hepatic artery, we see using the same technique that we discussed using for the, the renal artery anastomosis to make sure we get that gate in exactly the right position. We see that we've got a peak systolic velocity here of about five meters per second. That's really markedly elevated. So, uh, you know, I got in touch with the transplant team about this. Um, we talked with my colleagues in interventional radiology. They did an angiogram here. You can see this focal narrowing actually in two places in the proper hepatic artery corresponding to what we saw in ultrasound. They dilated that and stented that. And then the patient came back to me the next day with now these beautiful sharp systolic upstrokes in the right hepatic artery and a peak systolic velocity in the proper hepatic artery now under one meter per second. So their hepatic arterial supply was fully restored, no longer at risk for biliary necrosis. So in conclusion, I just want to say that, you know, reiterating what we talked about, ultrasound is the first line for imaging and identifying transplant complications. And really the key to being able to do that is to understand what the post-transplant anatomy looks like so you know where to look and what you're seeing. And if the transplant was done at your institution, the op report is your friend for describing what that anatomy will look like. And then knowing what the complications are so that, you know, the eye can see what the mind knows to ensure that you're getting the images that you need to evaluate what those possible complications are. So with that, I'll thank you for your time. Uh, if you found this interesting and you'd like to experience more of this firsthand, please consider coming to join us at UCSF for an abdominal imaging fellowship. And I'd be happy to address any questions that you can send to me through the Zoom Q&A. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Morgan. Thank you, Harp. Um, so you're looking at a giant screen that says pancreatitis. It's screaming pancreatitis at you. And I just want to, uh, start by saying I hope you all are well and safe, and it really is my honor to share uh, one of my favorite topics, and that is acute pancreatitis over the next 25 minutes or so.
these are my disclosures. So our objectives here are for you to take a look at this image and think about a few things. What are you going to say about this image? How are you going to say it? Who are you going to say it to? And what does all of what you say mean for the patient? So if we translate that into real objectives, we're going to talk about the imaging diagnosis of acute pancreatitis and focus on reporting using the nomenclature that's been approved so that we can all in our communications know what each other is talking about, because this is a pretty complicated subject. And what you say really has management implications for patients. Acute pancreatitis is a pretty big problem uh, with over 330,000 ED visits per year, so you're going to see this on call. There are a lot of admissions. Some of these are readmissions. These patients are uh, sometimes with severe pancreatitis, chronically sick. There's like a 20% readmission rate. So you're going to see them through all phases of acute pancreatitis, not just when they're what I call freshy freshy, but through their drainages. Okay, so lots of admissions, a huge cost to the healthcare enterprise. Um, and in our part of the world, the most common risk factors or etiologies for acute pancreatitis, as you know, are gallstones and ethanol use. And so we want to use our imaging to not only detect the pancreatitis and describe effectively the pancreatitis, but also to look for etiologies. So you can see in this patient who has inflammatory changes around the body and tail of the pancreas, um, lower enhancement indicating some necrosis in that part of the pancreas, whereas the neck and head are normally enhancing, uh, there are calcified gallstones. So you can make the diagnosis and also give a report as to the potential etiology. Now, only 15% or so of gallstones are calcified. So you have to see what is not there. So in this patient who also has acute pancreatitis, um, what we're looking at is a gland that's swollen with an irregular demarcation between the normal pancreatic parenchyma and fat that should be sharp, it's fuzzy. If you can't tell that this whole gland has some edema in it, then the characteristic fluid in the anterior pararenal space along anterior gerotus fascia and the lateral conal fascia tell you that there's some pancreatic inflammation going on. What you're looking at in the head is the dilated bile duct, but what you don't see is the stone um, because it's not calcified. Now, if I show you the same patient's MRI, and this is a T1-weighted fat-suppressed enhanced image, uh, you can see the morphology is about the same. The gland is swollen. There's some fluid in the anterior pararenal space. You can see the bile duct is dilated, but with MR, we know that we can do an MRCP, and here, there's some added value to showing those non-calcified stones. All right, so how do we really image patients with suspected pancreatitis? I've shown you some CT and some MR so far. Uh, when my residents ask, you know, we're challenged with finding this little gland that causes so much problems, I would say CT is king. CT is widely available. Most ERs have them right there. We have two that never stop spinning in ours. And CT is also good because with one scan, you have multi-planar imaging capability. So in this patient who has a gigantic explosion of pancreatitis in his retroperitoneum, you can see that part of the gland is necrosed. There's a giant fluid collection. He's also got ascites. There's just a whole lot of bang for the buck there. On the coronal reformatted images here, if I take you through, you just can see the entire scope of what's going on in this patient's body within about a 25 second scan once you take five minutes to get him on the table. So CT is very effective, readily available, and it's a great test for showing the extent of infl inflammatory changes in patients with acute pancreatitis. Now, MR is a really good test, and I used to be chief of our MR, and I love MR, um, but it's more expensive. It's harder to get a high acuity patient in there for 40 minutes or so, and even if you have an abbreviated scan uh, protocol like what we do, um, it's just not used as frequently, so it has smaller letters here. In this patient, on a T2-weighted fat-suppressed image, you can see that there's inflammatory changes surrounding the body of the pancreas. The bonus is that you can see the gallstone. And again, the pretest probability of having stones is so high in our part of the world, it's important for you to look for that. Now, we just saw some amazing ultrasound images from John's presentation. And I like ultrasound just like the next woman or man or radiologist. Um, but it just doesn't do an effective job in looking at patients with pancreatitis for a couple of reasons. One, even though we get a reasonable sonographic window through the lateral hepatic segment, for example, you really can't see a lot of detail in the pancreas behind it. There may be gas from the stomach, there may be fat. And so in this patient, whose ultrasound you see here, we really can't see the inflammatory changes that are in the retroperitoneum. We would have trouble telling if the gland was viable or not. So 
ultrasound is great for finding gallstones that you can't see with CT, but it's not really great for looking at complications of acute pancreatitis. Well, what about the new kid on the block? What about dual energy CT? For the patient experience, this is the same as a regular CT, but we can use the physics behind dual energy to actually interrogate the different tissues in the complex collections that are often seen in patients with acute pancreatitis. Again, if it's two in the morning and you're on call and reading the scan, you're probably not going to be bothered to do this unless the color happened automatically. So this is really still in the research or investigative realm. So I'll take it back around and just say CT is really um, rules for looking for changes of acute pancreatitis. And for example, this is a different patient who presented to the ER with scrotal swelling. His main concern was that, and he had a little bit of abdominal pain. And the coronal reformatted image shows that, yes, he's got fluid tracking down into the scrotum here, but it's because he's got a gigantic extra pancreatic retroperitoneal collection um, from pancreatic necrosis or from uh, necrotizing pancreatitis. Okay, and when you do a CT, you really just do a basic CT, single phase, portal venous phase with oral contrast if you can, um, and it, you don't really need to do a bunch of phases, and certainly using contrast is better than unenhanced scans for diagnosing the complications of acute pancreatitis. Now, for the rest of my talk, I'm going to really focus on verbiage that came to us from the Atlanta classification and the revised Atlanta classification. Um, so I'm just going to give you a little bit of the history of how that came to be. Um, back in 1992, a group of 40 experts interested in the pancreas got together to give us a framework for really a holistic approach to patients with acute pancreatitis. By that, they used evidence-based medicine to talk about how we should be diagnosing, reporting, and managing these patients. Okay, so it was a big multidisciplinary effort. And through those efforts, we got better at taking care of patients with acute pancreatitis, so much so that the words were not good enough that started off in 1992. So this was revised. Um, and they must have had more than 40 experts because it took six years or so to get the paper published. But really, when we think about pancreatitis, it's, I'm going to break it down for you to be simple. We talk about the morphology of the pancreatitis. We're going to have some uh, conversation about how we determine the severity of pancreatitis. And then basically, we're going to focus on what we're going to call all these changes we see in the retroperitoneum in patients with acute pancreatitis. So according to the revised Atlanta classification, the clinical diagnosis of acute pancreatitis requires two of the following, either abdominal pain suggestive of pancreatic origin or serum amylase and lipase greater than three times normal. If these both aren't present, you can have a CT and look for characteristic findings. This doesn't mean you need to get a CT on everybody. I know it sometimes seems like that when you're on call, and sometimes a CT can be faster than getting back a lipase. Um, but seriously, if these two things are present, not all patients with suspected pancreatitis need a CT, but it can be the tiebreaker. It was very important that they told us to uh, have a defined time of onset because what you're gonna call the collections in acute pancreatitis depends on how long they've been developing in the patient. So onset is when the symptoms began. That seems pretty common sense to me. And then disease severity, when you're looking at a patient, we need to think about projecting their uh, potential for morbidity and mortality in the first week based on how they look clinically. And then afterwards, that's where imaging comes in. Well, why is that? There's a disconnect in some patients between the early CT findings and their clinical status. So in other words, you know, it's the old ad adage, treat the man, not the scan. In the first week after symptoms begin, the severity should be based on clinical parameters and the one that is put forth by the uh, revised Atlanta classification is the Marshall score. So this is a score of physiologic parameters of renal, uh, pulmonary, and cardiovascular. Um, you might have heard in the past of Ranson scores and Apache 2 scores. This is the one that they suggest. Again, this is because we can underestimate pancreatic necrosis and the severity based on imaging if it's really early. And these patients have problems. They have morbidity and mortality that's related to uh, systemic inflammatory response syndrome and early multisystem organ failure. So we just look at the patient early on, and then later we look at severity based on imaging. Um, because what happens to patients and why they get sick and die with acute pancreatitis later is that they get infections of their retroperitoneal collections or may succumb to late multisystem organ failure. So if we look at this panel of pancreatitis uh, evolution in this patient, at presentation, you can see that the gland is lower in attenuation than the spleen. So is it just interstitial pancreatitis or is this necrotizing pancreatitis? By eight days, there's no doubt that he has necrotizing pancreatitis, and he has, therefore, severe acute pancreatitis. And by 14 days, you can see the evolution. 
this is all the same patient, it's all the same process, just looks really different as the days go on. So let's talk about how acute pancreatitis looks different. Morphology, basically, you just, if you think someone's got acute pancreatitis and you're on call, you say, well, is it interstitial edematous pancreatitis or is it necrotizing pancreatitis? Okay, it's a simple decision. So let's look at that. Interstitial edematous pancreatitis um, has inflammatory changes that make the gland appear swollen. It may look larger. There may be less distinction, or there will be less distinction between the border of the pancreas and the retroperitoneal fat. And there's fluid that's in the anterior pararenal space where the pancreas lives. Okay. Now, most of the time this resorbs, the patients have mild disease, they'll get better on their own without our interventions, and you can see that happen in this patient. Now the gland looks normal. So it's a self-limited, usually milder form of pancreatitis. These are all different patients who have interstitial edematous pancreatitis, and it looks different depending on how much fat they have in the retroperitoneum or how much fatty interdigitation they have in their gland, or whether you're looking with MR where you can see the T2-weighted fluid versus CT where it's low in attenuation. Okay. Now, with necrotizing pancreatitis, you may see that it involves just the gland, or in this case, a part of the gland. So if the pancreas is supposed to be enhancing about the same as the spleen and portal venous phase, you can see that there's probably a little bit lower attenuation here from edema, but there's geographic lower attenuation in this part of the parenchyma that is no longer receiving its blood supply. So this is necrotizing pancreatitis. This patient has a large amount of near total pancreatic necrosis here. So the gland is just not enhancing at all. This is a really sick patient. Now, this is confusing, I think, for uh, residents and for some of us practitioners who've been looking at pancreatitis for years. You can have necrotizing pancreatitis without glandular uh, altered perfusion. And so by that, I mean there's just fat in the retroperitoneal extrapancreatic area that is involved in necrosis. So at an acute phase, this may be hard to tell. This gland in this 32-year-old woman is a little bit edematous. There's certainly inflammatory fluid around it. Eight days later, you see evolution with some incorporation of fat into that collection, some wall formation starting. And six weeks later, um, she did not get better. This was a collection that required drainage. So these people that have extra pancreatic necrosis of the retroperitoneal fat don't do as poorly as those with glandular necrosis, but it's still necrotizing pancreatitis, and they may require more interventions than those that simply have uh, interstitial edematous pancreatitis. So she got an axios uh, wall occluding, uh, occluding stent. Now, here's what is most common, is to have both. So in this patient who has fluid in the retroperitoneum, that's an understatement, he has parts of the pancreas that are enhancing still with high attenuation. He has high attenuation in the fluid, meaning that there's blood. There's just a whole bunch of necrosis going on in both the pancreatic parenchyma and in the fat. And that's the most common thing we see. Here's another patient with necrotizing pancreatitis a little bit further on in his illness. Um, here you can see that anterior to the splenic vein, we really don't see the pancreas. That's where it is. That's how I tell my residents to find it. When it's not there, it means something is going on. In this case, it looks like it's fluid attenuation, similar to the societies. But really, knowing that the pancreas should be there, uh, whether it's looking at axial or coronal images, and looking at this little bit of heterogeneity, this is not simple fluid. This is necrotizing pancreatitis because the gland is gone, and we'll talk about that more in just a minute. And then, I hope y'all aren't eating lunch, but this is what came out. This patient got an old-fashioned necrosectomy. And instead of being fluid, this is sort of gelatinous retroperitoneal fat. The dead sequestrum is the dark part in the pancreas. So although they look like fluid on CT, these collections are often more complicated than you think. And in knowing that they were derived from necrotizing pancreatitis, um, that helps take care of them uh, with management issues later. Now, what if you can't give contrast? Okay, what are you going to do if you're on call and the patient's already got renal dysfunction and is sick, and this is what you get? Well, here on this unenhanced image through the pancreas, again, the margins with the uh, fat are obscured by peripancreatic inflammatory change. This same patient three days later, if we narrow the windows, you can start to see now that there's gland, there's fat around it where there's stranding, and there's probably some gland missing. I would say that with unenhanced scanning, when you see air in the collection, you know that this is necrotic uh, pancreatitis because Interstitial demis pancreatitis doesn't get infected like this. And so even though you can't give contrast, it may be tougher to say that there's necrosis going on here. But when you see the air inside the collection, we know that this is necrotizing pancreatitis.
Okay, a few more examples of different patients, all who are unable to get contrast because they have renal dysfunction from their pancreatitis. When you see fat incorporated into the collection, uh, it's generally necrotizing pancreatitis going on. And if you see high attenuation material in the pancreas on an unenhanced scan, this is a T1 fat suppressed MR showing this is blood and hemorrhagic pancreatitis tends to occur with necrotizing pancreatitis, not interstitial. So that's another hint that it's necrosis, even though you have not given IV contrast. All right, so let's talk about the collections in the terms of uh, the revised Atlanta classification. Well, you can see here I've denoted time. Remember, we talked about the time of onset being when symptoms started. We are going to break down what we call these collections, whether they're under four weeks or over four weeks. Okay, so collections that arise from interstitial edematous pancreatitis are either acute fluid collections, that's what you see kind of going around the pancreas in the retroperitoneal fat, or if it lasts long enough, it can turn into a pseudocyst. From necrotizing pancreatitis, the collection we see acutely in under four weeks is called an acute necrotic collection. The guys weren't very imaginative, but I'm actually glad because I think our words should reflect what's going on. If that collection evolves and the patient is supported through their uh, acute pancreatitis, it becomes walled off necrosis after four weeks. So that's what we want to use as our terms for describing these collections. Okay, so here's what they look like. An acute fluid collection is basically an enzyme-rich collection of pancreatic juice that's typically adjacent to the gland and lacks a wall. The majority remain sterile, do not become infected, and they resolve spontaneously. Okay, so in this patient, eight weeks later, she has just a little bit of fluid left over and hers turned into a pseudocyst, okay? Didn't go away altogether. It has granulation tissue holding it in. Pseudocysts are a collection of pancreatic juice that's contained by granulation tissue that require four weeks to form. And importantly, they are not supposed to contain necrosis, okay? That's why they arise from acute interstitial edematous pancreatitis. They can resolve spontaneously when small. If you're looking at one of these cases on call, it's important to say whether you think it may be involving the duct and communicating because that has implications for fistula creation if you're going to drain them percutaneously. And pseudocysts may be infected or not infected. So on CT, they're well circumscribed, usually thin-walled, homogeneous, low attenuation collections that are usually adjacent to the gland. On MR, there shouldn't be any solid debris on T2-weighted imaging. So this is a different patient whose T2 images show that there's nothing that's non-fluid in that collection. Okay, T1 pre-post looks pretty much like an ovoid collection of simple fluid. Now this patient had pancreatitis three months ago. And so this is actually a special kind of pseudocyst that's derived from disconnected duct syndrome. And I'll show you a bit more about that in a moment. Now, as opposed to those collections that arise from interstitial edematous pancreatitis. Now we're going to talk about the bad guys, right? So the acute necrotic collection, just like necrotizing pancreatitis, can be pancreatic, peripancreatic, or both. It contains both fluid and necrotic contents. And the honest truth is, initially there's necrosis where things are fluid and gelatinous and solid. If we wait long enough, 12 weeks, six months, eventually the body's attempting to make everything uh, liquid to resorb it. And so liquefactive necrosis goes on over time in patients with necrotizing pancreatitis. It's not a pseudocyst. Again, even though it looks low attenuation on CT, if you learn nothing else from me and zone out, please don't call these collections a pseudocyst, okay? Eventually, when acute necrotic collections get older than four weeks, they become walled off necrosis. So here are some examples of a patient who presented with nausea and vomiting to the ED. And you can see he's got a collection in his pancreas that's replacing part of the body here. All right, here's tail tissue. Here's tissue in the neck. This collection has to be from necrotizing pancreatitis, so we're going to call it an acute necrotic collection. Two weeks earlier, here's what he looked like. And it's tough to say that this is not interstitial edematous pancreatitis at the outset. Hence, uh, talking about disease severity in the first week based on clinical parameters, not imaging. But you can see there is a little bit difference between the uh, attenuation here and what became the necrotic part of the gland, if you look very carefully. Here's a patient who's got an acute necrotic collection that's become spontaneously infected. And this typically happens in the third or fourth week from gut flora. Okay. Here's walled off necrosis. So again, now we're older than four weeks in the patient. Um, this collection has been brewing. And even though the wall may not look super defined, if it's more than four weeks old, you really should call it, excuse me, call it walled off necrosis. So again, another low attenuation collection anterior to the splenic vein and portal confluence. It's causing inflammatory changes on the nearby duodenum. It looks uniform, low in attenuation. Um, on the coronal 
image, same thing. Looks like a big sack of fluid, but we know because the pancreas used to be there that there's more than solid, more than just fluid material in there. And this case shows that well. Here's a young man who came in. Again, we see the same thing. His pancreatitis was five weeks ago, so he has this walled off necrotic collection, which has some incorporation of retroperitoneal fat in it, anterior to the splenic vein and portal confluence. Here is his MR in the same week. So we can see with T2, the fluid component is bright signal on T2, but here is the pancreas. It's sitting right there. On our gadolinium enhanced T1 weighted image, you can see that it's just not enhancing at all. So he had necrotizing pancreatitis. That's his acute phase CT. Again, really tough to call that, although it's in general, the whole thing is lower in attenuation than the spleen. Um, and it's still sitting in there. It hasn't really gone away. It just looks fluid density on the CT. Now, when Waldorf necrosis is infected, this, these are the messiest and typically the sickest patients, okay? This is really something that uh, usually needs attention and drainage. And even when we do drain using lumen occluding stents, large caliber stents through the uh, stomach wall, it may not be enough. And so you, you may see these patients coming back into the ED after they've been drained as they uh, still aren't getting better, they may develop fever. And so in this patient, if I show you his video, he required not only the axios stent through his posterior gastric wall into the collection, but he had cross pigtail catheters through there. He had some percutaneous strains in both his anterior perirenal space and in the peripancreatic space. So he avoided surgery and we can effectively treat patients this way. But again, because this now becomes chronic treatment of their acute pancreatitis, you're gonna see them come back into the ER. And here's his collection five months later, completely drained. All right, so I'm going to finish up talking about some complications that you may see. Again, because while the patients are acutely ill, they're going to be in the intensive care unit, but at some point they're going to go home, often with drains in place, or they may go home with their sterile collect collection that becomes spontaneously um, infected. And here's a case of that. So one complication of necrotizing pancreatitis as it evolves in the patient's body is that it becomes infected. And so here is one that got infected because it was incompletely drained, because someone thought, hey, it looks like a pseudocyst, it's fluid density, I'm just gonna put a small caliber catheter in there. So here you can see acutely um, evolution to just a larger and larger collection that was causing him to have gastric outlet symptoms, so he got drained. But when it, he was drained with just a seven French percutaneous stent, the solid component left in there and this became a secondarily infected collection, okay? Again, this, is something that we can treat with percutaneous endoscopic and limited surgical drainage. You just need to do something uh, to get the, not only the fluid, but the gelatinous material from the retroperitoneal fat and the solid chunky part of the pancreas out. So here he is after complete drainage. You can have catheter complications in real time. Here is perforation of the stomach uh, with an endoscopic uh, approach. Here is a patient who has a stent that is supposed to be in the retroperitoneum using irrigation uh, to come out through the axio stent, and instead the stent is in the stomach, so they're irrigating the stomach, and that's not going to work well for the patient. So he came through our ED because he wasn't draining well, and that's what was happening with him. Now, what about spontaneous fistulization? This is a happy complication for the patient because they're basically draining themselves. And so you can see in the evolution of this patient's necrotizing pancreatitis, the acute phase where it looks like it's just peripancreatic, some collections forming. This is acute necrotizing pancreatitis and an acute necrotic collection. This extra pancreatic predominantly. He came in with having had no one uh, intervene upon him, and you see gas in the collection, um, and it got smaller. Now, I would say most of the time when you see gas, you need to be worried about infection of a necrotic collection, whether it's an acute necrotic collection or Waldorf necrosis, but if it gets smaller, you might suggest that there's a potential for spontaneous fistulization. Here's a patient with disconnected duct. Now this arises when the gland pretty much does not have necrosis that's parenchymal, but there is some focal necrosis that involves the duct so it becomes amputated. So here we see a uniform low attenuation collection. And what's important here is that upstream from it, we see the pancreatic tail with a little bit of a dilated duct. Okay, you see that? It looks like it's leading right into that collection. Earlier, Here's an ERCP showing the opposite end of the duct. It was amputated, sort of right there in midline. So what we're not seeing on the ERCP is all this portion. Okay, so we know he's got a duct that's no longer in communication. And so we can actually see this with secretin stimulation, MRCP. And so if I can show you this video, 
um, when we give secretin to stimulate the pancreas to put out its exocrine juices, the part of the pancreas that's still connected to the duodenum can go ahead and excrete. What happens to the upstream duct? Well, if you look long enough, you see it spurting out there in the tail. This is still coming out through a hole that um, is in the disrupted duct, and it will either fill a pseudocyst, or if there's still a communication with stomach, it may fill that lumen. So we can tell that someone's got disconnected duct uh, by doing this test. Now, what about hemorrhage? This is something that happens, and you'll see the patients in the ER uh, with hemorrhagic complications of necrotizing pancreatitis. So this person was transferred. We knew he was coming. We set up his scan, not with only portal venous phase, but with an earlier phase to look at the vasculature. And sure enough, he has a small pseudoaneurysm coming off of the splenic artery proximally that is bleeding, and it's making the swirled appearance that you can see the actual stream on the earlier phase. If you were just reading the portal venous phase alone, I think that would be a challenge to say he's actively extraving on this particular CT. Just with his uh, physiology, you would be suspicious of that. But here's a case of a patient, and this is where, where dual energy CT can really help. We have some in our emergency departments. Um, this patient had pancreatitis a while back, six months earlier, and he was at home and had sudden onset of abdominal pain. We did our portal venous phase CT, and you can see that there's some high attenuation material here in the posterior aspect of the collection. Well, these are different dual energy scans, and what's most important is what we see there follows the signal of iodine, and we can use dual energy to create a non-enhanced non image, which we don't routinely get anymore with pancreatitis or pancreas evaluations, and it wasn't there on the virtual and enhanced exam. So we know that this is extravasation, even though it's on a portal venous phase CT, even though sometimes without a precon you can't be sure, you can build one with a dual energy scan. Finally, here's a patient who came in with vomiting and decreased crit. He has hemorrhagic necrotizing pancreatitis based on his scan. Uh, because he was so sick, he went straight to our interventional suite where you can see that there's a pseudoaneurysm of the splenic artery. This was coiled, and they also put a stent in. And I want to show you this. Twelve weeks later, we can see that the stent is still in place in the patient's splenic artery. There's now a gigantic collection, bigger than it was before, because he probably has a disconnected duct. And it looks fluid attenuation, like so many cases I've shown you this morning. Or, sorry, it's morning to me, it's still afternoon to y'all. And look what happened to the coils. Instead of being up there by the pseudoaneurysm now, they've actually dropped into a dependent portion of the collection because over time, he's undergone some liquefactive necrosis. So that begs the question, how do you tell walled off necrosis from a pseudocyst when it just looks like a big bunch of fluid in the abdomen? Well, typically, walled-off necrosis collections are larger. They may extend into the pericolic space, so in big, big in the gutters there. There's irregular wall definition, so pseudocysts tend to have a more crisp wall. You may see this incorporation of the retroperitoneal fat into the collection. To me, this is the biggest hint. If you're on call and you can't decide, you can't give contrast, you see fat in that collection, it's necrotizing pancreatitis. And especially when you see that there's pancreatic deformity or discontinuity, you know that this collection arose from necrotizing pancreatitis. And even if it looks like fluid, someone who's going to drain it needs to prepare for more than just fluid to be in that collection. Okay, so that's the biggest thing. That's the biggest take home. And if nothing else, remember that walled-off necrosis does not equal pseudocyst. This, by definition, is supposed to have no necrosis. It doesn't arise from necrotizing pancreatitis. And if you're in doubt, just call it a collection, okay? So over our time together, we've talked about how to image patients with suspected pancreatitis, how to report your findings using the nomenclature of the revised Atlantic classification, because this is a multidisciplinary effort so that when your report goes to the ED and that emergency department physician, it also is equally as relevant to the subspecialists that are going to be taking care of the patient once admitted, who are going to be doing the drainages, and so everyone's going to be on the same page knowing what's going on in that patient's body. Okay, with that, I thank you so much for your attention. I look forward to your questions coming to me through um, the Zoom, and thanks so much for your attention. Have a great day. Thank you guys, both Dr. Mongan and Dr. Morgan, for two really great talks. We so much appreciate uh, you taking the time to do this. Um, I'd also like to thank the attendees, and we will see you again next Tuesday for our next um, uh, set of lectures. So uh, have a great weekend, and uh, be well, everybody. And thanks again, uh, John and Desiree, once again.